significance. <coughs> um, as a start, whenever if I need to give a talk, I still don't quite have my sound right here. Excuse me for Yes, whenever I invited to give a talk, I guess I'm always did have a discussion I had with uh, Chris Lundy Higgins many years ago, and I guess maybe some some people in the audience might have met had the nice opportunity to meet, meet Chris. And Chris always observed that when you're invited to give a talk, really your first instinct is to try to tell everybody everything you know about the particular topic. But invariably, that's absolutely what you shouldn't do. So in design, this talk, I struggled a little bit about, because I, I fall for this too, I'd like to tell you all the work across the spectrum of uh, audiovisual processing that we do, but in the end, I decided to give kind of, in effect, three talks. The first talk is going to give just a general background, and I think is a bit warm up for the uh, for what will come next. The core of the talk here is the audiovisual processing of emotional signals, um, and the final talk, or the, yeah, the final component is to talk about the work we're doing on dance and trying to move from emotion to kinesthetic empathy and to more naturalistic displays. So hopefully you'll get something out of the individual components of the talk. <laughs> Among the different uh, components. So, for the general background, we can start with just what I'm going to tell you first is really just kind of the pathway that I took into multisensory integration work. And then I'm going to talk about, slightly, our work on expertise and how expertise affects audiovisual processing. And specifically, our work on drumming. And then I'm going to go a little bit into the neural mechanisms of synchrony, per synchrony perception. Now, I'm going to be talking about neural mechanisms later, but first I'm going to talk about the synchrony perception. So the, the first kind of encounter I had with audiovisual processing was the work I did in tennis a while back. And we had novice and expert tennis players judge these computer animations of tennis serves as either top slice, top spin slice, slice or flat. And overall the experts did a little, little bit better than the novices. And it was all Boss gave us yesterday about processing times. You could cut and, and say the fastest ball speed is 70 milliseconds. Well, then you kind of get the idea that, well, it's going to take 100 milliseconds for the sound to get there. But maybe 400 milliseconds for the ball to get there. So that does give you, if you can do something in 300 milliseconds with the sound, well, then maybe you can use the sound of the ball impact. And I, I never pursued this, but it was just, I mean, some friends were beginning to think I was a little bit crazy from moving from point by visual motion displays to tennis anyways, and I thought, well, it's interesting, but I, I don't think I'm going to pay much more attention to it. And then a few years later, uh, we are doing some work on the recognition of affect, and these were some knocking actions, and you see the motion capture data of the actors up here. This is an afraid, an actor portraying afraid. That's an angry one. Okay, and what we found was, if you ask people to judge these, you can get the responses, I'm not, I'm not going, going to go into the methods too much, but you get a psychological space kind of representation. And what you find is that one dimension of the psychological space correlates really nicely with the velocity. And I mean, that was nice for the visual recognition of emotion, and I was really happy with that. But as I went around and gave the talks, uh, particularly at the talk I gave in, in Oslo uh, to Girlfinger Good Noise group. Uh, afterwards, some people said, well, you know, really, when I see these kind of things, and a few other people observed it, I kind of hear the knocking. And I said, there is no knocking there, is there? And I said, no, there's no knocking. But, I mean, they're right, you do, you do, you are able to simulate what that knocking sound would be like. And furthermore, uh, Alexander Gensius said, Oslo also observed, well, you can just simulate the, the sound movement, or you can simulate the sound of these actions if you wanted to, and I thought, well, that's good. 
But again, I, I never, I never really pursued that. So these were the the first the near misses. And even with the near misses and what I'm going to talk about later, there's one point I want to make: is that in the real world, physics determines everything. So what this, what it's going to look like, and what it's going to sound like, is determined by the physics of the world. But when we move these things into the psychology lab, the psychologists take a lot of freedom in controlling what, what you'll see visually and controlling what you'll hear through the ears. And in that sense, I mean, it came up with a question yesterday. There's a trade-off between controlling your, your stimulus exactly so you can make really precise conclusions versus validity in the larger domain. And that's something that as you see in the progression of research, when we go to the dance work at the end, we're really trying more for ecological validity than for control. But what happened eventually was I did say, well, yes. And it was, I was uh, talking to Sophia Dahl about drumming, and I was also supervising a uh, master's project with David, David McCormick, and it kind of came to me, well, I could do this sacred perception with drumming and look at expertise. And what we did was to say, well, you know, we looked at the general concept of sacred perception to say, well, you know, sight and sound don't have to be precisely aligned in time to perceive something as a unitary event, right? And I think that's, that's the large part of what Charles spoke about yesterday as well. It's just, you know, there is some slop in how organized or how aligned the sight and sound have to be. And a really common way to study that is through the, the, what's called the, the temporal integration window. And I'll show you an example of the temporal integration window here. So <clears throat> basically to do it, you need to create displays at, you know, you create audio visual displays at different levels of asynchrony, and then you obtain judgments. So you might present something 25 times, and how many times out of those 25 are people going to say, you know, you present it and you say, well, was it synchronous or not? So you just collect up the numbers, and you get, so these fill-in circles are the data points, and then basically you fit that with the Gaussian curve. And the two numbers we commonly work with the most are the point of subjective simultaneity, that's the peak of this fit, the curve, where that's where people perceive the audio and the visual to be aligned. And as I point out, the PSS is generally positive, not in every case, but in most cases, the point of subjective simultaneity of the audio and visual is positive. I mean, about 80 milliseconds or so. And we also, the other property we look at is the full width of half max of that curve. And the full width of half max of that curve gives us some idea of the tuning specificity. And probably a lot of you have already, but what I'm going to illustrate for you now, if, and hopefully the sound will work, is what the displays look like with this. So that is the audio leading the video by quite a bit. That's a physical simultaneity. That's a PSS. audio lagging. That, yeah, the final one was the audio, audio lagging the video. And you basically just show that range of displays, and those are the kind of displays we use in our drumming study, and you obtain the judgments. And I'm just going to summarize the behavioral data, because we have a, a few papers out on it, uh, and you could summarize it pretty easily is that basically if you look at the synchrony perception in drummers, 
what you find is the point of subjective simultaneity moves towards zero milliseconds, so it's closer to physical simultaneity, and the tuning gets more narrow. The, the width of that temporal integration window becomes less wide. But in addition to that, the experts are able to come up with a temporal integration window robust to, I mean, if points are missing in the drummer's arm, the, the drummers still come up with a good temporal integration window, whereas the novices fall to pieces at some levels. They're also robust to changes in the tempo and the accent structure of the, the drummer's beats, and they're also robust to changes in orientation of the orientation of the drummer and the co manipulations of the natural covariation of the vision and the auditory signal. So <clears throat> we have the data on so we know behaviorally the drummers do much better. But what we wanted to do, and what, what, what we've uh, completed one study on, is well, we know you get this smooth temporal integration window. So and we know it's smooth and shifted to the right. It's going to change in width and change in uh, uh, change in location. And we also know from previous studies that there's a you know generally speaking there's a brain network for multisensory integration. And using F, using fMRI, what we've been exploring is what can we expect brain activation to reveal. And I'm just going to go over a few of the a few of the results because. Really, I mean, what we're interested in is it's a network of brain areas, and if we look inside that network, what can we find that's going to indicate expertise, or it's going to indicate the changes or the existence of the temporal integration window? At least one of the things we found for if you contrast asynchrony versus synchrony is activation in the cerebellum of the drummers. And for those of you who don't know, the cerebellum is an important brain structure for things like timing and, and especially motor or especially motor function and other cognitive functions. And essentially what we find is that the drummers here, if it's synchronous, the drummers have much less activation in the cerebellum than the novices do. And the, the next slide makes that a little bit more clear. Um, where here we have, you know, our drummers on average have 24 years experience. The top was 42, the, the, mind, the bottom of the range was about 8 or 14, I think. Uh, but if you look at the, I mean, with no practice, you get activation in the cerebellum. With lots of drumming experience, you get much less activation in the cerebellum. And we tried, to, we tried to fit this into a model where the, we're saying what the cerebellum is doing is giving sort of a binary uh, error signal. That you know, it's asynchronous, so you get an error signal in the cerebellum for the asynchronous display. So a stronger error signal for the drummers. But that, doesn't, that explanation doesn't quite work. And what we, what we think fits the, the data a little bit more is just that the drummers are able to use less resources to, to process the drumming signal, that when a synchronous drumming display comes up, the drummers are very good, or very efficient at processing it. And another bit we've done, and I guess one of the shortcomings of the work we did on the drumming is we only looked, we looked at asynchronous displays, and we looked at the optimally asynchronous displays, audio coming a lot before video, and we looked at the synchronous displays at the, you know, we showed people their own individual display that was optimally perceived as synchronous. But what we think we need to do is to understand things better is to go in and look at multiple. I mean here's audio leaning uh, minus 400 up to 400 and to look at all of these different leads and lags of the audio. And if you do that, if you just contrast all the video, all the times where audio is leading to all the times when video is leading, well, then you end up with activation there. I mean, in an area that uh, Charles spoke about yesterday, the superior temporal gyrus, uh, where basically what you seem to have is a brain area that apparently is signaling just whether it is asynchronous or not. And I guess the, 
what I, yeah, this is delivery data, Scott Love's PhD, and everything that I told you before was for drawing, but Scott is using face voice combinations in this, so that potentially some of the differences could be due to the face voice stimuli. Uh, but the point I was trying to make is that we know there's this smooth temporal integration window, and awfully what we'd like to do is to be able to look at the different parts of this brain network and be able to understand what aspects of that brain network are contributing to the, the shape of this temporal integration window. So when you see this nice smooth curve, and then you look at this sort of almost binary function, it gets a little bit challenging as to how exactly things are going to go forward. But if that's, that's really one of our goals, and I'm with the synchrony perception research, and I'll, I'll probably leave it there. Uh, that, you know, what we think we need to do is, to understand synchrony better, is you know, some more behavioral displays, along with some more brain imaging displays, to try to explain how you get this, the shape of this temporal integration window within, uh, how you can explain the shape of the temporal integration window or the behavior of the temporal integration window, let's say for expertise, within the context of the brain activities you find. Okay, so that's, that's the first, you know, that's like I said at the beginning, I was going to give basically three talks. And that's the first talk, a little bit of warm up. And now I'm moving into the, I guess the fundamental aspect to link up with the, the title of the talk. And I need to point out that a lot of this work is by, uh, well, uh, Karen was really very active in the drumming study as well, but the emotion work is, has been done by Karen Petrini, uh, who's here at the meeting. So, what I'll give you, in talking about this, what I'm going to do first is give you a little bit of a brief overview of emotional processing. Then I'm going to move into the, the brain imaging data we have and background from brain imaging with focus on in our experiment with music and musical gesture, which we'll see carries through to when we start, start looking at dance. And then at the very end, I'm just going to show you some displays we're working on now to, to look at dyads or social interactions of two individuals. So, the, the first point to make is just, we're, we're talking about cue combination here. So it's, you know, up to now I've been talking about synchrony perception. And we have to put the synchrony perception a little bit beside, to the side for the moment. Because I'm really going to conceptually talk about things before. Before what I was saying is, well, there's the sight and the sound. We're going to always present you with the sight and sound, but we're going to change the relative time. Here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, we have an audio signal and we have a video signal. And basically we're either going to show you just audio or just video or audio and video. And when the audio, when we show you the audio and video together, they might match up. But how they match up is going to be something we manipulate. So it really is just, I mean, I'm talking about Q combination because we're saying, well, audio is a Q, video is a Q, and we're going to combine them. And if you look at the work of Colin John in 2008 uh, for faces, he makes the point that it's a flexible system. It's a flexible system, but it's seeing the vision dominates over the audio. So when you're looking at that face talking, what you're seeing in the face is dominating over what you're hearing when it comes to emotional expression. And another point to make is the affective signals are integrated even when they're discordant. So if you construct this, this scenario where the emotions of the two, the audio and the video signals, all don't match, they still get integrated, or they, they still influence each other, which is a sign that the cues, there's some obligatory integration of the two channels of information. So, like I said, Colin Young suggested that it was a flexible system, and I mean, it, it's flexible, it seems great enough that, you know, when Vines in 2006 was studying tension trajectories and emotional trajectories and listening to a clarinetist play, he, he found that, you know, really the music plays a dominant role in shaping the emotional experience of the uh, 
update server. And the care of Trinity uh, let's study where it showed really similar results where the sound of the music dominates from the music. So, Slide two, just to let people know. The first part of the talk was warm up, which is good because now the training here with more people. So, what I'm beginning to talk about now is the core of the topic of the, uh, the presentation, which is audio visual processing of emotional signals. And what I'm going to do now is, I, I, well, what, I'm, yeah, what I was just starting was a brief overview, then I'm going to talk about some fMRI. Then I'm going to introduce some new work we're doing. And where I was starting was to talk about cue combinations. So what I'm talking about now is we're treating audio as one signal, video as another signal, and how do these two signals combine? So what I pointed out is Colin Young from his work in 2008 with Faces and Voices suggests that it's a flexible system. He says that, or the data says, that vision will dominate over audio in these face-voice combinations. And furthermore, there's evidence for integration by the fact that even if the, informa even if the emotional information is discordant, it's still integrated. So, what, we just, what I just mentioned is that the system does seem very flexible, because in face voices, the face, the visual information seems to dominate, but for music, both the, the, the work of uh, Vines and colleagues and Karen Petrini and myself, showed that it seems that sound dominates over the musical gesture. And one way to show this is, and it's also an illustration of the, the uni unity assumption that Charles spoke about yesterday, is here if we plot out the inverse efficiency. So what we've done here, I'm just going to walk you through this and hopefully you'll get it. We're plotting inverse efficiency of a unimodal, a bimodal congruent, a bimodal incongruent for instrument and emotion, and a bimodal incongruent for emotion. And that's a lot to really process right now, so I'm sure it's still early in the morning. Some people aren't going to get it. But remember the vision, the, audit, the auditory information dominated. And the auditory information dominated, and if you ask the people to attend to the auditory information, what you find is, oh, no, the thing to point out is this is inverse efficiency, so low numbers are good. So auditory information is the dominant cue. You tell people to attend to the auditory information, and there's really no difference between any of these different cue conditions. Okay? But if you get to the case here where there, you ask people to attend to the visual signal and do the task of, well, what emotion do you hear in this display? Well, if it's unimodal, if it's, you know, which is just auditory or visual, if it's bimodal, you it's an audio visual, and it's congruent, or if it's bimodal incongruent for the instrument and emotion, meaning that you have to generalize, well, yeah, meaning that you have to generalize across emotion and instrument. For all those, the, the inverse efficiency goes up a little bit, but this goes up hugely, and that's the case where it's a bimodal incongruent for emotion. But that means it's incongruent for emotion, but it's congruent for the musical instrument. So what it means is you're asking people to, to attend to the non-dominant source of information. And when they, when they see a sad display and they hear a happy one, then, they're inefficient, then their inverse efficiency goes way up. So that's when they're really bad. Because it's this unity assumption that when, so oboe sounds, you know, when they see that, when it's the same instrument, then they, this unity assumption kicks in, and there's an obligation to process them together, 
and then their inverse efficiency goes up, or their, their ability to disregard the other information goes, goes away. Which they were really good at disregarding the other information when they were um, disregarding the other information for the other kinds of conditions. Now, I hope I didn't con confuse you for that much, because I thought it, I mean, it was a nice example of the unity assumption that Charles spoke about yesterday, so I thought I would point that out. So, the, the next thing we're, I'm going to talk about is the bulk, and we're moving to the brain now. So, these, this is a series of experiments that Karen led, where, <clears throat> what I have to tell you first is a little bit of the background. Well, the background is the superior temper gyrus and the right thalamus have been found to, to have greater activation for audiovisual emotional stimuli. So the regions that we think we should be looking at are things like yeah, STG and right thalamus. As well, the amygdala has been found to have greater activation for the congruent fearful stimuli than incongruent stimuli. Now, our results end up pointing towards another brain structure, which is the insula. And it's, I mean, there is other, this is evidence that shows that for multimodal correspondence, the insula seems to play a role. So the question we asked in our research was, does the anterior insula have a crucial role in detecting audiovisual emotional correspondence to use? Or audiovisual emotional correspondence? Um, and I've given a little bit of a hint away already when I talked about the previous study of Petrini and also the drumming a little bit about what we're biased to use. So I mean, what's, you know, we want to study audiovisual audio -visual processing and it really is open to you. A lot of things make sites, you know, a lot of things you can look at and listen to. So what we decided to work on was, I mean, based on some of the work of Charles Spence, as as well as our earlier stuff with drumming, we said, well, let's, let's stick with music. Because we know that, and certainly there's been a lot of nice studies in the music literature looking at emotion processing. So, the, the stimuli was selected from that previous study I, I showed some results from, and I'll show them here. Well, they're coming out a bit, not so dark on my display, but... Um, maybe you can I'm not sure how well you can see that. Maybe not so well. Well, is it a... Yeah. Anyways, that was the sad that saxophone player. That's the happy one. And here will be surprise. So those are the kind of displays we're using in this brain imaging experiment. <clears throat> so what we do is we have three emotions and three samples of each, and we're going to show either audiovisual displays or the visual or the auditory components of those kind of clips I showed you. Uh, and what we do is we sh we either show audio and then we get and it's going to be either a sad, happy, surprise, we'll get a response, then we go to fixation, and then we'll show, let's say, an AV display, and then we'll get our response, and then we'll go to a fixation, and then we'll go to, let's say, visual display, and then get a response. And it's the, the order of A, A, B, and B are random, are kind of balanced through the, a genetic algorithm. So, that's the way the experiment runs in the scan. People are seeing either audio-visual displays, visual displays, or audio displays, and they're being asked to make a judgment of what the emotion is. So if you look at the responses during the scan, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, just, but to make the point that well, people are, I mean, here we see the blue is surprise, the green is happiness, the red is sadness, and we break it down by the audio-visual, audio, and visual components. And generally, what you see is, I mean, you see some, some variation there because, you know, the different emotions seem to be conveyed, conveyed differently by the different modalities. But what you find, generally, is the audiovisual 
is either the top, or I mean the, the bimodal congruent is either the top display or very close to the top display. Whereas here, in this case, the visual information in the for the happy display is it gives you the lowest percent of correct responses. But I mean it's really just to convince people that the observers weren't a chance when they were making that judgment in the, the scanner. So <clears throat> What you find is, if you do a conjunction analysis, which means we say, well, let's look at what happened in, look, well, what was the brain activity in the audio visual condition? And let's find when audio visual was greater than visual. And that'll give us a set of areas. And then let's, the intersection of that, when audio visual was greater than audio. So if you do this conjunction analysis, what you're left with is a set of area, is the brain regions that are involved in multisensory processing. I mean, there's, it's, it can be a little bit uh, controversial exactly how to define what contrast to run in brain imaging to find the multisensory regions. But certainly this conjunction analysis gives us one, one way of, of coming at it. And what you find is we get the right thalamus activated. And if you look here, you basically see that if it's an audiovisual signal in the blue, you get higher responses than e either of the unimodal cube conditions. Which argues that the thalamus, I and mean, we also get the Coleman um, in the cerebellum active, but which argues consistent with the uh, data from Krefeld's that the, the right thalamus is involved in multisensory processing of emotions. But what we went on to do, what, what struck us is that the temporal correspondence we're always showing things that are in temporal correspondence with each, with, with each other. When I say each other, the audio is always in temporal correspondence with the video when it's an audio-visual condition. What we wanted to do is say, well, let's break the audio-visual temporal correspondence. So we're going to, and let's just manipulate things emotionally. I mean, what we want to do is to say, well, we're either going to show, or we're going to show some combination of, in our Q conflict condition, we're going to show some condition of, a happy, you know, a happy visual display of the saxophonist and a sad uh, auditory display of, of the music. So, <clears throat> by, by breaking the temporal correspondence, we're able to look at purely just the emotional processing component. And I think, if I show you, the next slide is going to show you the, display, the, the displays, and I think it will be a little bit if you're not catching on, hopefully you'll we'll catch on now what, what the important point is here. That, you know, temporal correspondence was violated for both emotionally corresponding and emotionally non-corresponding displays. And I'm afraid you might not, if, uh, you might not be able to see it with, with this level of visibility, but we'll see how it goes. So if you look closely, the sound you're hearing isn't being played. Well, I mean, I guess that's, that's the easier case. That's, the vision is the prize, and the auditory is sad. So it was the sad sound, and it was the, the surprise movement. And they don't temporally correspond. It's a little bit harder to catch here, where that is a surprise move, that is a surprise visual presentation. And it's also a surprise auditory presentation but they are taken from the same exact segment of playing. So you don't have temporal cor there isn't strict temporal correspondence between what you're hearing and what you're seeing. What is congruent is just the emotional, or what is either congruent or incongruent, or matching or mismatching, is just the emotional content. We've broken the temporal correspondence between the audio and visual components, but we've kept the emotional correspondence. So the, the experiment goes, we had six matching and 18 mismatching displays per run, and it went something like you'd see a mismatching, then you'd be asked to make a judgment, fixation, you'd see matching, be asked to make a judgment. I think that was everything. Um, yeah, it was the same 16 non musicians who performed as before, and the order was coming about us as before. Okay? And the results here, I mean, you would predict, 
Well, you should predict. I mean, in experiment one, we got the right thalamus. Uh, a lot of other people got the right thalamus. So you predict that the right thalamus should be carried through here. But what was interesting about these results is the only thing we found in our contrast of mismatching versus matching um, is the insula with larger activation for the mismatching displays than the matching displays. And here's the, the time course of the bold signal, and there's the, the contrast estimates. So basically, I'm just going to move to the summary here. Uh, the, the results of experiment one and two indicate that the right thalamus I mean, it consists with what other people are finding. It's integrated, it's involved in the integration of emotional signals, but it might not be involved in the cross-modal emotional correspondence. In, in distinction to that, the, the anterior portion of the insular cortex appears to have a crucial role in detecting the correspondence between the emotional components of the signal between the visual and the auditory domains. Okay. So, what we have there, or what we're trying to conclude from this, is that our results are going to confirm the idea that the anterior insular cortex is involved in the detection of cross-modal correspondence of emotion. So what it's important for is creating a coherent representation of the emotional content of what you're experiencing. Now that's, the, that's where I dropped this study. And I, I'm going to move on now, change gear slightly. We're still on emotions. But I'm going to show you uh, some work we've done on perception of... We have, we're doing the... Uh, we're doing the behavioral work now. We hope at some point to take this to brain imaging. But what, we, what we're looking at is how two people interact. Because I mean, there is always this question that you know, if, you're, if you're dealing with speech or you're dealing with music, people always say, well, that's just a really special situation. How do you know music, speech, generalized to something that we're going to use every day? So what we wanted to do was get something where really is just everyday activity. It's like you're in the street and maybe you're locked up. You might be lost by a bit, and you might think of asking for directions. I never do, but you might think of asking for directions. And you see two people, you know, you have to choose who to talk to. So if you see, see two people having a discussion, and you see them moving, you hear something about their voices, maybe you don't know the language, or maybe you don't know the meaning of what they're saying, but you have to infer whether they're having a fight, whether they're having a laugh, what's happening between those two people. And it's those kind of interactions that we wanted to, to explore. So what we've done is to create some different experimental conditions. So we have neutral. And I'm showing you the displays first, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we got them. <clears throat> so that's a neutral interaction. This is a negative one. And this is a positive. Those are the kind of interactions we're looking at. Just two people coming together and having a little fight or chat or laugh or whatever. And the way we get these displays is basically in a, in a motion capture studio. And you can, oh, it's really hard to see. But that, that's Scott Love there practicing for his PhD thesis defense. And what we do is we, you know, it's, we attach the markers to the actors. And here's a schematic of the room. There are basically 12 motion capture uh, ca cameras in the Vicon system. And we just have people walk along the diagonal and have this interaction. So like I said, we're just at the behavioral stages right now. And what we do is, well, you know, we have neutral, we have negative, neutral, and positive displays. And we can pre present them in the combined queue, the audio-visual versions, or we can do the auditory only or the visual only. And these are the percent correct responses. I'm sorry, that's cut off and a bit small. Um, 
But you can see that, in this case, the audio visual condition is, well, it's, that wasn't significantly different. It's either highest or top, but in the negative and the positive, or no, I guess neutral, sorry, that's right. In neutral, everything was the same. There wasn't really any difference between any of the conditions. In the negative and the positive, the combined Q condition was higher than both of the single Q conditions. So there is some benefit of combining the Qs together. And also, if you look at the ratings, you see the same thing, that the audiovisual improvement displays have the highest ratings of, of, the, of the appropriate response. So <clears throat> we're hoping to, but what you might, yeah, what you, if you're going to be a little bit critical, look at it and say, well, the negative seems much higher than the positive. And there's various reasons, and you know, right now we're collecting the, um, the stimulus set for this. And it gets a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit complex about how to get how to get all your interactions so that you have a nice baseline. And that's what we're working on now. This is uh, work by Lucas Piewek for his PhD thesis to try to, first of all, come up with a nice set of movements that we could use for further, further uh, exploration where we have the calibration done really well. <clears throat> so the conclusions, I think, over this whole section is if you look at the behavioral data, it, it does seem to be a flexible system. There really isn't any fixed rule about what's going to dominate for what particular kind of interaction. I mean, as you can see, or I guess I didn't point it out, the, the again, the, which is it, the auditor, no, wait, the visual only is dominating over the auditory. So it seems like there's a little bit of an advantage for the auditory information in these dyadic displays. So whether it's going to be auditory or visual dominating is going to rely a little bit upon the task. Um, which is kind of nice because it shows that the system has a lot of flexibility, but it's kind of bad in a way because if you're an experimenter trying to explore this, it's like, well, what is the right set of displays and the right task to look at to, to study audiovisual integration? The next observation to make is that the for just emotional correspondence, uh, if you get rid of the temp if you get rid of the temporal correspondence issue with the displays, you find that the insula plays an important role in matching different sensory information. So that's kind of the end of the second part. And what I'm going to try to wrap things up with is, like at the beginning of the talk, I made the point that you either have a lot of control over your stimuli in the lab, you can create all kinds of wow combinations that never happen in the real world, or you can try to show things that are really quite naturalistic. And we're half trying to go to naturalistic, it has to be a little bit more worry about aesthetic preferences as well, because we're moving towards things like dance. And it'll come, it'll become more clear later, but really what we're trying to run counter, first of all, what we're trying to run counter to is so many experiments out there, they're going to look at, they're heavily influenced by the face literature and emotion research. It says it's happy, angry, sad, neutral, and there's a list of about seven things, and that's fixed. And really studying emotions, particularly facial emotions, that's I mean, that, that seems like a, a wonderful way to go and really has helped the field a lot. But if you're, well, let's see, uh, so show you the next example. If you're a choreographer trying to come up with a dance, it, you're a bit limited with that set of basic emotions. So we want to look at other states. And also, three seconds, if you're looking at something like dance, well, three seconds isn't really a lot of time to come up with a full idea. So the example I give is uh, from a study we did on Buto dance a little while ago, where the I mean the choreographer Irina wanted to come up with movements that represent anger, calm, fear, fragile, happy. These are all her aesthetic things that she, as a dancer, wants to convey, and she doesn't want to be limited to seven basic emotions. She really wants to be able to open the possibilities to can, what can I express through these dance movements. So you can see that it's it gets a little bit it gets a little bit open ended. 
what we've tried to do to make it a little bit more close-ended is to to try to develop something uh, related to kinesthetic empathy. And this is part of the uh, the watching dance project that Kareem Yola has been has been working on. And I mean, a lot of kinesthetic empathy comes from you know the old line for love term by Titchener, which you know talks about projecting yourself into another. You know, to project yourself into what you observe. So it's always going to be a consequence of empathy is always a consequence of what you observe. And you know, a lot of people argue that empathy is really very important for social interaction as well. That you know you understand others' intentions and feelings and predict the future based a bit on your empathy of what's going on. And then it, it can form a, a, a glue for the social the social world. I mean, for instance, if you didn't know that it hurt somebody, then you you know you might keep hitting them. But you have some empathy if you're if you're putting someone in pain. So kinesthetic empathy is, I think, a useful concept. And it's also been useful since we're, on oh, this Watching Dance project, we're working with uh, a lot of people in qualitative audience research. And in qualitative audience research, this idea of empathy, or kinesthetic empathy, is really a very, really very commonly used. And it's the sensation of participants in the movements one observes and experiences related feelings and ideas. And the state by the statement by Daly that you know, dance is fundamentally a kinesthetic art. Okay. But you know, kinesthetic is it, 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 it's a slippery topic to define, and there are no clear definitions in the neuroscience or the behavioral literature. If you if you look at sort of the extended the extended mirror neuron system, you can find a touching on concepts of empathy and kinesthetic empathy. Uh, as well as some of the work of Cal Beatrice Calvo Marino talking about aesthetics, you touch on some aspects of kinesthetic empathy. So we're hoping to steer these results towards some understanding of kinesthetic empathy. Uh, but to do that, we're, we think we're, you know, we're, we're bound by this aspect that the dancers and if we want something that has some credibility in the dance world, the qualitative audience research world, we need something that goes beyond just snippets of three seconds, um, little dance fragments. So what we've been working on is to say, well, you know, how can we get, what ways can we study the whole dance performance? And one of the first issues we came up with is just the fact that, well, you know, dance by itself is beautiful. I don't necessarily need to hear the music or, you know, but, but in so many cases, uh, you, dance is accompanied by music. So, before we got too deep into kinesthetic empathy, we wanted to see, well, maybe we'll get something out of kinesthetic empathy, but we at least want to look at what, what we can get from audiovisual processing of dance. And to do that, what we did was to look at did a brain imaging experiment. People were in the scanner for about 19 minutes. And what they saw was either a visual or an auditory or an audio visual presentation of a six minute long dance sequence. And in, and in between the sequences of the dance, there was about 16 seconds of fixation. So you can see the dancer, in this case, on the visual. Then you'd, and that would go on for six minutes, and then you'd get a fixation. Then you'd see the, the vision for, oh, you see the vision, and you just have to point out the scanner's kind of noisy place. So you, you always heard the scanner. Um, you see the vision, and then you get 16 seconds of fixation. And then you'd go to the final case, where you'd see, uh, no, you wouldn't see anything. You'd see a static image. Uh, that was balanced for frequency, spatial frequency content, and you'd listen to the dancer. So, I'm going to show you examples right now. So, that's an audio visual presentation.
That's a visual presentation. And that's the audio. And we kind of purposely selected that this Baharatane of dance, which is a classic Indian dance going back millennia. Because we were testing it on uh, British observers, and they didn't have a whole lot of experience. So we were kind of looking at just pure dance. I mean, it's also a narrative dance form, so she's telling a little story. And also, most of the uh, British people don't understand the story that's going on, and they, don't, they aren't that familiar with the music. So it really is just a, a kind of pure way to look at uh, dance and music without being contaminated by a memory of our memory of expectations of what the dance is about or what the, what's coming next in the music. So there were two analyses we did. And the first analysis is the kind of thing that Uri Hassan promoted in his 2004 nature or science paper, where he said, well, what you could do is just look at the brain and you, know, you show people a big, long display. And what you try to find later is the regions of brain, I think I should have shown you that. These curves here are the averages of brain areas activity. And what you can see is, and this is over, this is over a long period of time, and what you can see is, regardless of the observer, the brain acti activity for these particular areas is roughly correlated. It's not perfectly correlated, but you get certain brain areas that are correlated for all your observers. So what you're really looking, what you're really looking at is uh, brain areas that correspond to what's being presented across all your observers. So that's one way to analyze the data. Just look and see what areas of the brain correlate. The other analysis we did um, is kind of the standard general linear model kind of approach where you say, you know, you have three conditions, the red, the blue, the green one, and you model each one as some sustained activity taking into account the hemodynamic, the, the hemodynamic response function that it takes the coupling with the, the blood takes a little while to for the signal to develop. But basically the idea is you model you model the green act, the green events, you model the red events, you model the blue events, and then you contrast the difference between those different conditions. And from those contrasts you're able to say something about the brain activity compared across the different conditions. And the, the issue this either is or isn't an issue. You tell you talk to some people and they just go that's a big problem, or you tell some other people, they go, well, yeah, no problem. Because the, 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 the issue is, is that generally speaking, this kind of modeling of sustained activity, really people think, can't go on much more than 15 seconds, right? I mean, you just think about your own common experience when you presented something or have to listen to something. You can pay attention or, you know, have some, yeah, directed attention to that for about 15 seconds, and then things begin to fade. So this is at the end of an hour talk. So I guess I should expect that there's probably some people out there that are fading on my presentation as well. But the point I want to make is that we're assuming that the activation is constant over six minutes. And that's a little bit problematic for these people for the general model of the GLM, where you assume it's only going to be valid over 20 seconds. So but I only tell this because in, in the end it comes out okay. And so the first analysis we did was just to say, oh, this, uh, I guess it, it's maybe worse from my angle than yours. Um, so the first question was just, does the combination of, oh no, the green isn't working, is it? So I'm sorry that they aren't showing up quite as well. But basically what we did is to say, okay, well, we've shown people the art. We presented either the audio, the visual, or the audio visual. And let's just look at whether our what areas of the brain synchronize for the different for our collection of observers. And the A is in orange and is the audio. And basically what you get is audio regions correlated. Right? When you show the when you show just the vision of the dance, which is represented in blue, um, and I can see, you get visual areas being activated. 
And when you have the AV, which is represented in green, you get both the audio and the visual, and well, what seems to be some multi-sensory regions as well. So, and I mean, it's, uh, it's one of these things where the, uh, the picture is, I think, more convincing than my words. So, I apologize that it isn't coming across as clear as it, as it might. Uh, the, the next thing we wanted to look at is to say, well, let's take the audio and contrast it with the video. Or, or the question is, some people say, would assume that there's going to be some cross-modal perception in this. That, you know, if you're hearing the music, you're going to expect some, to see something. Or if you're seeing something, you're going to expect the music to, to, to perform in a certain way. So the question was, well, is there any crossover between the audio and visual? Or when we look at crossover from the audio and the visual, do we find correlation in auditory regions? Which would mean that you're seeing a dance, but somehow you're stimulating what you should be hearing with that dance. So that you find correlation in the auditory regions. Right? Because I mean, some people would argue, and I think, I think if we go to some dances, we might be able to find it. But for this dance, we didn't find anything. When you, when you looked at, across the modalities, you found the AV correlated with the vision in visual areas, and the AV correlated with the audio in the audio re region. And there wasn't any spillover with what you're seeing of the dance driving activity in the auditory cortex, or what you're hearing about the music causing some corresponding activity in what you're seeing in the dance. Um, and again, it might be, it might think it's clear in the, you know, AAV is orange for audio, so yeah, I mean, these are auditory regions of the brain, so I think that should be clear to people, but the A, B to AV in blue is, uh, is, I don't think is, is so apparent. But the final thing we did was to say, okay, well, let's co contrast the results of what we got in the multi-sensory integration, or contrast. We have, the, we have the correlation results that I've already showed you two, uh, the previous two slides have been how the intersubject correlation works, how the different observers' brains activity correlate among themselves. So we have all the reasons defined through that intersubject correlation across the entire time course of the, the movement of the dance. What we do now is say, well, let's just run you know, one of these conjunction analyses on our, on our audio-visual, you know, audio-visual greater than visual, audio-visual greater than audio, take the intersection of that. That gives us our conjunction analysis, and that's shown in yellow. So when you run the conjunction analysis, you get these kinds of temporal parietal regions that are known to be active in cross-modal processing. And they also show up. They're also showing up in the, in the green areas, which are the ones from the intersubject correlation. So I think we're going to skip the summary slide next, which which goes on and says, I think repeats what I just said. But the main point I wanted to make here is that, for this, is that it, it seems that you can get activity, or that the correlation, the intersubject correlation data we have shows activity, or shows that the observers of these dances synchronized between observers in the audio regions when they listen to it, in the visual regions when they watch it, watch the visual display, and in both the audio-visual and audio-visual integration areas when they have the bimodal presentation. And, so I'll skip the summary to just go to the however, which is the however you know, and I think I gave you a little warning earlier. What we really wanted to be able to talk about was kinesthetic empathy. And there's no reason, I mean, sometimes you're just a hostage to the data. And, well, you're a hostage to the data, but you're also, you, you decided which new light to show people. 
And it could just be. I mean, what we would have loved is if there had been some activation beyond visual and auditory and multisensory processing regions, and if there had been some activity in, you know, if you had activity in the thalamus or the insula or any of these regions that are more implicated in emotional processing, then I could have gone back and told you a little bit about kinesthetic empathy. But I can't because really all we've been able to show in this study is just that the sensory areas, the sensory areas correlate and the multi-sensory areas correlate between observers. But <clears throat> You know, what we think is that this is due to the nature of the dance. And if we just get a little bit more adventurous about which dances we use, or perhaps manipulate the past a bit more, we might be able to expand, expand the kind of analysis to further, further brain, brain region. So yeah, I think we just, it, it's an ongoing project and we're, we're working on it uh, in the present. Um, so, that's kind of one role for the future. And the other issues for the future are, well, I think I said this already. We need behavioral brain data results. We need to work with both behavioral experiments and brain data to come up with a better idea of multi-sensory processing. Because it's really difficult, I think you have to generalize over a lot of different stimuli and tasks to, kind of, to come up with the general mechanisms. And we need some more, we, we're planning to work some more on how experience modulates results. And then I'll just finish with the many people who've helped, helped me on this project, in particular, it's Karen Petrini, who's here. And I'll be calling on if you ask me a tough question. Uh, and I want to thank the audience for, uh, for listening to the talk. Thank you. <laughs>